All right, so welcome to our lecture 11 in this course on the history of mathematics. Today we're going to talk about the resolution of what's almost certainly the greatest problem in the history of science. So the general is, topic is me mechanics, but we're going to focus on the mechanics of the solar system. And the greatest problem of, of science, historically, has been to explain what's going on with the night sky. How to explain what goes on in particular with the planets. Figuring out what goes on with the sun and the moon against this backdrop of stars which are rotating above us every night, that's not too hard to do. But figuring out what the various planets are doing is a very complicated undertaking that all ancient civilizations were interested in. And many ancient civilizations created astronomical observatories to try to predict and to explain what was going on. And this was really the great achievement of the 17th century, where finally this problem was more or less solved, and with it the framework of science was erected. So the 17th century is really a high point of the history of mathematics. We're talking about the 1600s, roughly that period, which in my view is the most important century in history. If I had to rank the various centuries in terms of importance, I would put this one uh, as the first, and the second one would be the 18th century, and then the third one would be the 19th century, and then after that I would rank the 20th century. in terms of the importance of the, the mathematics that was discovered in those various times. And nothing that we have done in the last hundred years in mathematics, at least, can, can really compare with the work of uh, these gentlemen in resolving this most important problem. So let's, uh, let's go back to uh, the, one of the people who really started it was Nicholas Copernicus. Okay, a Polish astronomer who rather courageously tackled the dogma at the time, which was that everything goes around the Earth. So from Ptolemy, ancient Greek mathematician, 200 years after Christ, who was sort of the father of uh, the subject in terms of having created this major work, the Almagest, that was sort of the Bible to later astronomers. So in his theory there were these epicycles and it was Earth-centered. So we had the Earth and everything went around the Earth in various ways. The Sun went around the Earth, the Moon went around the Earth, the various planets went around the Earth, Mars. The known planets at this time were, would have been Mercury, Venus, Mars, uh, Jupiter, and Saturn. Aside from the Earth, those are those the five uh, planets that were known since ancient times. And although the Moon and the Sun's motions are reasonably predictable once you've studied it for a few years. The planets like Mars and Venus and Jupiter and Saturn are much more irregular. They kind of move around and they wander back and forth and they do strange things. So this was the the framework that had been around for a long time and this was what Copernicus challenged in his uh, great work which was only published uh, near the time of his death. Okay. And in it he proposed that we should think about changing from an Earth-centered story to a Sun-centered story. So it was a heliocentric, heliocentric system where the Sun was at the center and everything more or less revolved around the Sun.
Well, actually, Copernicus was not the first person to have suggested that. That idea, in fact, goes back to the ancient Greeks also. So a, a notable Greek astronomer, I think it was Aristarchus, also suggested this. But it wasn't really taken, it didn't catch on. Although Archimedes had a fair amount of respect for that. Ancient Greeks. In particular, when Archimedes, one of Archimedes' books is called The Sand Reckoner, and in it he proposes to uh, calculate how much sand can, can fill up the, the universe sort of as an exercise in big numbers. And one thing that Archimedes realized that if this idea was right, that the Earth actually went around the sun, then the other stars had better be very far away from the Earth. Because if the Earth is actually moving, goes around once a year, then the Earth is probably going a long distance from one side of the sun to the other. And that would mean that if you had some stars which were reasonably close, then they would look different from he he this position than from this position. So you would expect the configuration of stars to look different if this was the case, unless the stars were very, very far away. It's kind of a necessary consequence of having a heliocentric point of view, that the stars have to be very far away so that there's no parallax. Okay, so, uh, and, and, and Archimedes sort of realized this, incorporated this idea that the stars had better be very far away if we're actually going around the sun. Okay, so that's what Copernicus suggested, and he worked it out all out mathematically using essentially Ptolemy's mathematical framework. So trigonometry played a big role, spherical trigonometry especially, tables of chords that Ptolemy had used were all employed by Copernicus to try to give a mathematical model that sort of proved that this view fit with the data that had been collected at the time. And Copernicus ended up using a kind of uh, epicycle approach of Ptolemy that the orbits were more or less uh, circles. Okay. The orbits were pretty well circular, or maybe we had to do circular plus some additional circular motion around uh, the circles. Plus sort of other uh, smaller circular motion. So Copernicus didn't get a lot of fame for this theory during his time because he, he died uh, very shortly after it was published. But it did have a big influence on the subsequent um, mathematicians and astronomers. Let's talk a little bit about Galileo, famous Italian scientist, mathematician, astronomer also, who was some people say the father of, of science, okay? sometimes called the father of science, because he advocated a point of view to the natural world that said that it's really mathematics which is underpinning the scientific world that we're observing. That we should explain or try to explain the natural world by looking for mathematical laws. And he advocated sort of an empirical approach to things. He said, we should actually go out and observe things. We should go out and observe things, make observations, make recordings, and see how they fit with our mathematical models and, and adjust things if necessary. Right. This is sort of a foundational idea that you can get truth by going out and looking and being very careful, observing very carefully, and then coming back and making your observations fit with some model. Okay? It's not self-evident that, that that approach works to explain the world. And it hadn't really been uh, developed until his time. So father of science plus an empirical approach namely uh, observation 
was uh, important for him, for him. And one of the th kinds of things that he was uh, interested in is what happens if you drop a weight off a building. What do falling objects actually do when they fall? So here's a building. And you drop some object and it starts to fall. And eventually hits the ground. And uh, Galileo realized that this object sped up as it fell. That when it gets to the bottom, it's going faster than it was uh, in, the in the middle or up at the top. Okay, so falling objects speed up. Okay, that's good. But how exactly do they speed up? How do we describe this dependence of the velocity to where the thing is? Well, so he in, was thinking about a velocity, so let's call the velocity v. Okay? And the velocity v probably depends on the distance that the uh, object has fallen since we, it started. And it also probably depends on the time. So these various variables around, the time, the distance, the velocity. And at first, Galileo was unsure whether the velocity was proportional to the distance or whether it was proportional to the time. So these are two hypotheses. So one hypothesis is that the velocity is proportional to the distance. Whoops. So that you double the distance, the velocity is going to double too. Or velocity is proportional to the time. You double the time and then the velocity doubles. And this was, uh, both of them roughly correspond to our intuition. It's a question of going out and observing, as Galileo realized. It's the scientific approach. Armchair theorizing is only so good. We're talking about the physical world. We have to go out and actually look. And he went out and did experiments and made measurements and so on, and eventually realized that it's velocity that's proportional to time and not to distance. So in other words, the velocity ends up being some constant times the time. And that means that if you differentiate that, it means the acceleration, which is just the derivative or the rate of change of the velocity with respect to time, the acceleration is going to be constant. So he deduced that falling object is experiencing a constant acceleration. Okay, it was a very key uh, aspect to the way things move. <coughs> so falling objects experience constant acceleration. And because he was interested in the motions of things, he was also interested, interested in projectiles, which was a big thing at those days because people were perfecting their cannons. Right? And people were quite interested in, you know, he wanted to bombard a city. How do you get your can cannon? How do you uh, slant it in the right way? So this, this sort of story of projectile motion, you've got a, uh, a cannon and it shoots off. And then Galileo realized that the arc of that projectile was essentially parabolic. Okay. Parabolic arc. <coughs> so the 1600s, the 1700s, they were kind of a period of, uh, of a really vital dynamic period in the history of, of science and math. Uh, there wasn't really such clear divisions in the various disciplines as we have now. Physics really hadn't been developed, or was really only developing at this time. There wasn't really a, a theory of chemistry. There wasn't really a, much of a theory of biology. Uh, 
Now we have a lot of compartmentalized disciplines. But back then, mathematics embraced astronomy. It embraced projectiles. It, em it embraced optics. Uh, sometimes it embraced astrology as well. But it would also embrace other things like maybe stone, stone cutting or, 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 or design, or architectural design. So the mathematicians of, of the day did not really think of themselves as just mathematicians. They thought of themselves as being interested in the world at large and just trying to explain what was going on. There weren't such clear boundaries as there are today. So almost all these major figures would have had a great interest in astronomical questions. That was always a really interesting subject. Galileo, we should also say, uh, adopted Copernicus's heliocentric point of view. And at some point, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, started realizing that this was maybe not such a good thing according to the doctrine. Because certain parts of the Bible refer to the, the earth as being stationary. And secondly, because it kind of makes us feel good to have a, a theory where God's creation is in the middle of everything, rather than going around the sun, which is then the sun becomes more important. So the church became quite antagonistic to Copernicus's views. And in the time of Galileo, he felt a lot of pressure from the church. At one point, he was arrested. He was shown the instruments of torture. Back in those days, they had the Inquisition. The church was, was not always a very friendly uh, organization. They would torture you if you didn't, uh, didn't ascribe to the, the views at hand. And he was shown the instruments of torture and, and very um, uh, correctly uh, said, OK, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> so he recanted. But, of course, he, privately, he would have still maintained his beliefs. But in the, his last years were all spent under house, house arrest because the church was still suspicious of his activities and didn't allow him to go out. And he had to smuggle, he had to smuggle uh, some of his, his very important works out via relatives and get them published in, in Holland. There was a bit of intrigue going on there with Galileo. Okay, and then we come to uh, Tycho Bray, who I think was a, a Danish astronomer and a very great observational astronomer. And he wasn't exactly so much a mathematician, but he was an, an excellent observator, uh, an, an excellent observationist. Is that the right word? Um, he, he created a fabulous astronomy. Uh, he created a fabulous astronomical observatory. I think he was given a big, a large amount of money by, by a king, and perhaps near Prague, somewhere he had a little island somewhere where he created this um, observatory. And there he made much more careful observations of the various orbits than had been done up to that time. Very, very careful, painstaking observations of where Mars was every single day, where the moon was every single day, you know, recording exactly where everything was over a long period of time. And his observations became very critical in the important developments of Kepler. So Kepler, Johann Kepler, was another one of these in interesting uh, figures that sort of have one leg in the modern world and one leg in a kind of a mystical view of things. Kepler was a very able mathematician, brilliant mathematician, an astronomer, but he also had the sort of mystical side that it expressed itself in a number of ways. So Kepler was Johann Kepler. Was a mathematician who was interested in lots of things, but he had a particular interest in the platonic solids and the Archimedean solids, which are a generalization of the platonic solids. I should say and generalizations. So I remind you the platonic solids are the, the dodecahedron and the icosahedron and the cube and the tetrahedron and the octahedron, the five platonic solids. And he also uh, studied 
more general things where you're allowed to make an object with two kinds of faces, not just one kind of face. It's called an Archimedean solid. And he also created other kinds of regular uh, star-shaped objects like that. That turned out to be quite important in his interest in astronomy because he became a, an assistant to Tycho Brahe. and was tasked with taking the mathematical observations and trying to make some theory, to try to create some theoretical framework for these astronomical observations. And he did. But he created several theories. So his first theory, which he was very proud of, was a theory that explains the various orbit sizes around the sun. So we have the sun here and then uh, inside the first planet is Mercury and then we have Venus and then there's Earth and then there's uh, Jupiter, no Mars and then Jupiter and then Saturn. This is not the scale. So he adopted a Copernican point of view by this time. And the question is, well, how can we explain the relative sizes of these circles? So to Kepler, these were at first just basically circles. They're all pretty close to being circular orbits. And they're all pretty close to lying in a plane. They don't go off in completely different directions. So they're almost all lying on a plane. And a natural question is, you know, what is the relationship between these various radii? And to Kepler, it was no coincidence that there happened to be six planets and five platonic solids. And he thought this must be connected somehow. And he was able to cook up a theory which these days it seems like a pure coincidence. But the theory is that the various planets are all on shells. So you kind of have to think of spherical shells that contain each of these orbits. So you have to think of these spherical shells surrounding the sun at various radii. And he explained the relative positions of these shells explained by nested platonic solids. So if you have a sphere, you can put a cube inside it. Okay. Or maybe we could say if you have a cube, you could imagine from that cube, there's actually sort of two spheres that are naturally associated to it. One is the sphere that circumscribes it, that goes right around the vertices and touches the vertices. And then a slightly smaller sphere that touches the faces. So inscribed sphere. Okay, so I have to imagine these two spheres. One is touching or going through the, the various vertices, and the other sphere inside is just touching the faces. It's a circumscribed and an inscribed sphere in that cube. Okay. So what he said was, if you start with the, the shell of Saturn, okay, and you may put a cube there, so make it the circumscribed sphere of a cube, then the inscribed sphere is going to describe the or orbit of Jupiter. Okay, so the, the relationship between Saturn and Jupiter is given essentially by a cube which circumscribes this orbit and inscribed is, gives this orbit. And then to go from Jupiter to Mars, uh, there's another platonic solid. Maybe it's a tetrahedron. I can't quite remember. Uh, 
So you have to imagine now going from uh, Jupiter to Mars, the circumscribed sphere going through the vertices of a tetrahedron, and then an inscribed sphere touching the faces corresponding to, to Mars. Okay, and then from, so that was maybe a tetrahedron. Oh, I'm not sure if I get these right. And then from Mars to Earth was, I think, perhaps a dodecahedron. And then from Earth to Venus was an icosahedron. And then from Venus to Mercury was a octahedron is the only one left. So the separations between the orbits, the outer two, all the way to the inner two, were described by the relative ratios between the circumscribed spheres and the inscribed spheres of the five platonic solids. And this fit with the observations very well. Didn't fit perfectly, and throughout his career Kepler kind of adjusted things and gave reasons why it might not have fitted perfectly, but this was his, his idea. So it fits very well with the observations. And you could have imagined his, his sort of joy at, at having this practical thing about the sky and the motion of the planets connected with these beautiful platonic solids. So here was sort of a harmony of, of God's mathematical side and, and the physical side. He thought about music, he thought about the harmony of the spheres and so on. Okay, these days it's just a strange coincidence that this works. Um, no one takes this seriously these days at all. But Kepler also worked on another problem which was to have much greater consequences. He also thought about the orbits of the various planets and whether they were in fact actually circles around the sun. And I hope we can appreciate these days, you know, you have this massive observational data from an astronomer that says that on June 11th, you know, Mars was exactly in that direction. And then on, Mar and then on June 12th, at some other time, it was exactly in that direction. So you have all this data, reams and reams of data, and from this data, you've got to figure out in your mind where the, where the whole thing, where the planet's actually going taking into consideration that the, that the Earth is going around the Sun and the Earth is spinning around its axis while it's doing it. Okay. So to reconstruct the actual model of where the planet is at any given time, it's highly non-trivial mathematics. Highly non-trivial. So Kepler studied the motion or the orbit of Mars. And he had various theories. At some point he realized that it was not quite circular. Okay, it was some kind of ovoid. So this is even this is not exactly the epicycles of, of Ptolemy that result from having an Earth-centered point of view. This is already when you realize that things are going around the Sun. So there's Mars, and it's doing something that's pretty close to circular around the Sun, but it's not quite a circle. So it's some kind of ovoid, some kind of more general curve. So what kinds of curves did Kepler have to draw on. Well, one kind of curve that was floating around was a, a kind of an, a curve that had studied, been studied from the ancient Greeks. If you take a, a torus or a donut and you cut it with a, a plane, like say in this direction here roughly, then you can get a curve which has a sort of an oval shape. Right, this is called an oval of Cassini. Well, that was a candidate. Maybe it's, maybe it's the curve like that. Or another kind of curve is the sort of epicycle kind of uh, thing where you have 
a circle rolling on another circle. Okay, so maybe you have this circle rolling on that other circle and you, and you mark a point on it and it kind of does some, something like that. But what Kepler eventually realized that the correct curve is a conic. Okay. or a conic, which algebraically were simpler than these curves because they were given just by a degree two equation. And the kind of conic that he realized was going around was an ellipse. And Kepler's first law is that the planets move around the sun in elliptical paths with the sun at a focus. So the sun is actually not in the center of the orbit. It's sort of off to one side. So to exaggerate it a little bit, if here is an ellipse, that's more exaggerated than the, the planet's orbits, but it would have two foci. Okay, and I remind you that the foci of an ellipse have various nice properties. For example, if you reflect a, a sound wave there, bounces off and comes back to the other focus. So this angle is the same as that angle. Or this spread is the same as that spread. Okay. So these are the foci of the ellipse. And what Kepler was saying is that if this is the sun, then it's going to be at one of the foci and the planet is going to go around the ellipse with the sun at one of the focuses. But he was able to deduce more. He was also able to figure out the second law which is that equal areas are swept out in equal times. Okay, that means, there's the sun. If the planet is moving around here, and it, in one month, it say, goes from here to here, then the next month, it's gonna go from here to here, then this area and this area are gonna be the same. So if you, if you plot the various, uh, months, for example, then what you're going to find is that each one of those segments has the same area. And since this part of the orbit is closer to the sun than this whole part over here, it means that the, the planet is much going much slower in this more distant area. And it's going faster in this area. So it doesn't go around uniformly, it goes around like this and it speeds up as it goes close to the sun and then it, when it gets far away, it slows down. And the difference depends on the eccentricity of the orbit, sort of how far the sun is away from the center of the orbit. Newton, who explained these laws, Mathematically, Newton realized that this is essentially equivalent, this second law, to what we now call the law of conservation of angular momentum. To the law of conservation of angular momentum.
And then there was also a third law, which is more complicated. So Kepler's third law, let's just say that it gives a relation. It's a relation between, between the period of the orbit and the average distance to the sun. In other words, orbits which are close, planets which are close to the sun, go around faster than planets which are far away. So these are laws that Kepler deduced by studying the observational record. Kepler did not explain these laws. He just said these are observations, these are the consequences of Tycho Brahe's observations that I've been put together. And then we come to the, the great genius who put this all together, Isaac Newton, who figured out that Kepler's laws really are consequences of very simple, more fundamental laws. Okay? There are yet simpler, more fundamental laws that, that force this to happen. So New Kepler's laws are the consequence of, well, what are now called Newton's laws of motion. Newton's laws of motion and Newton's law of gravitation. And with these laws, he really brought into focus Galileo's idea that mathematics could explain what's going on. And he really sort of found the holy grail that people had been searching for for thousands of years to explain in a simple way why it is that the planets do what they do. It's hard to overestimate the importance of Newton's accomplishment here. Okay? This is, in my view, pretty well the, the greatest accomplishment in the history of science okay? and really sets up the modern world this idea that what's going on out there in the, in the world is not some kind of random, impossible to understand stuff that you can just sort of describe qualitatively. That there are laws which are mathematical that can explain even seemingly complicated things. That seemingly complicated things can be reduced by seeing them in the right way to very simple ideas. Such an important and influential idea that really drove the development of, of science and mathematics in the next couple hundred years and still going on today. So this had enormous impact on uh, the development of our modern world. So what are these laws and how did Newton use them? Well, the laws are okay. I'll just say, say them simple-mindedly. The first law is that um, unless there's a force, without a force, velocity is constant. So, if you have some object which is moving at some velocity, and you don't subject it to any force, then it's going to keep moving at that velocity. It's not going to speed up, it's not going to slow down, it's not going to change direction. It's just going to keep on moving. This is a great insight because it's contrary to what we experience in ordinary life. Ordinary life, you roll a ball, it rolls, it slows down, it stops. You throw something up, moves, eventually comes down. Everything slows down and stops. But that's because of friction. Friction is a force that's retarding the, the velocity. But in the absence of a force, velocity is constant. 
That's what happens, for example, out in space. If you're away from all other objects, a particle is moving. Once it starts moving, it just keeps on going. Okay, very simple but key insight. Second law, that if you do have a force, then you can compute the acceleration in a very simple way. Namely, if you know the force, then the force is proportional to the acceleration. Or it's usually written as an equation, F equals MA. Okay, these are in fact vector quantities. So if you have some particle that's moving along, then it's got some acceleration. And the acceleration is roughly, you know, how the velocity is, is changing. So here the velocity is in this direction, then here, then here. The velocity is changing with an acceleration that's in this direction. And the Newton's law says that we can compute that acceleration if we know the force on the particle. If the acceleration is in this direction, it means that the force is also in this direction. And the constant is the mass. So what, what we can get at through this law is we can get at the acceleration. If we know the forces, we can get at the acceleration. This is now going to be a basic principle for, for mathematics in the next couple hundred years, that if you know the forces, then you know the acceleration. And then you can get at the velocity by integrating. You have to integrate to go from the acceleration to the velocity. And if you want to go from the velocity to the actual position, then you have to integrate again. So if you know what the forces are, then you can calculate the position, but you need to do still some more work. You have to be able to integrate. Or as the, the 18th century mathematicians would have said, you need to solve a differential equation a second order differential equation because there's really two integrations that you need to do. Okay. The 17th century people didn't think so much in terms of differential equations but that became very popular once Euler started applying uh, his understanding of this situation. So it really became a second order differential equation. And what about the third law? There's three laws of motion. The third law is that every action has a equal and opposite reaction. Has an equal and opposite reaction. So if I hit this duster, well, that duster is also hitting me. It's not just the duster that's feeling something, my hand's also feeling something. Or if you're stepping off a, uh, a boat, there you are. You want to take a big step to, to get up on the land, you take a big step and you go forward. So your motion in that direction is balanced by an equal motion of the boat in that direction. So you're going to go forward and the boat's going to go backwards and if you're not careful you're going to end up in the water, as many people probably can attest to. Okay, and then there's the law of gravitation. Which is a very large scale law that mostly applies to, to big things. Okay, but in fact it applies to small things too, but the force is sort of small there. But if you have a sun, and if you have an earth, or you have a moon, then the sun and the earth attract each other. Okay, there's a force of attraction 
due to the uh, attraction of the sun and the earth. And this force is proportional to, well, it's proportional to the mass of the sun and to the mass of the earth and proportional to the square of the distance between them. So if you double the distance, then the force becomes one quarter what it was before. If you divide the radius by two, come up twice as close, then the force that you feel is four times what it was before. Okay, and this constant is also important, Newton's constant gravi gravitational constant. Okay, and so with these laws and his newly discovered calculus, Newton uh, made probably the, the greatest mathematical calculation of all time. All right, so his calculation is what happens if you have a sun and you have an earth and let's say this earth is at, at some point you know, traveling in that direction. Well, if there was no sun here, the first law would tell us that this earth is just going to keep on going. But the sun here means that this earth feels a force. That force depends on how far the earth is away from the sun. If it's far, it feels a small force. If it's close, it feels a big force. And that force, given by the, this law of gravitation, gives an acceleration to the Earth. It means that the velocity is going to change. Instead of being there a minute later, it's going to be a little bit like that. Because the velocity has changed from this to this. The change in the velocity is in the direction of the acceleration. So that a second later, it's no longer going in that trajectory, it's going in that trajectory. And then another, a little while later, it's going in that trajectory. And eventually, it creates an orbit which is a conic. Newton proved that the orbit is a conic. And he proved that the sun is going to be at its focus. And he proved that the areas swept out in equal times are equal. So he derived Kepler's laws as consequences of his laws of motion and this gravitational law. So the, the Principia calculated that Kepler's laws are correct. A little bit unfortunately, Newton, was, who was a great fan of Euclid and ancient Greek geometry, didn't bring the calculus side of this to the fore. Because calculus was this recent innovation that he had made, he realized people may not be that familiar with it, so he wrote it up, putting the calculus a little bit to the side and framing everything in terms of geometry which made it a little bit maybe complicated to understand. But it's still one of the great works of, of all time and this was really the culmination of this long, long history of, of, of a problem actually finally being solved. Finally, we know that these things are conic sections, they're ellipses, or sometimes they can be hyperbolas if we have a comet coming from outer space and it starts, if it's aimed close to the sun and starts feeling the attraction of the sun, then depending on sort of how close it gets, it will be swept out, it will form a hyperbolic um, orbit, which is actually almost close to parabolic. Most comets are pretty close to being parabolas. Well, when I say comet, I mean a comet that doesn't return to the Earth. There are also the comets that do return, their orbits are very elongated ellipse, like Halley's Comet. They come back every couple hundred years or every couple thousand years. So most of the time we don't see them. They're off in some far distant part of the solar system. And every few hundred years they come by and they give us a big show and then they, then they go off again, come back a couple hundred years later. But they're also subject to exactly the same laws. 
okay, so it was a, a great a great time. People were very excited. They knew they had a lot of power with this new mathematical point of view, and, and this was certainly one of the culminating achievements of, of uh, in mathematics of all time. All right, next time we're going to have a look. We're going to skip forward a little bit to the 19th century and talk about the beginnings of non-Euclidean geometry. So I'll see you then.